wounds that produce smell. You know, it, it's amazing how disruptive smell itself is for somebody who has a wound. And you can see on this slide the types of wounds often associated with significant smell. Now, I would like to share with you, you know, I've been doing quotes all day long. Well, it's probably, I could have done worse. I could have shared song lyrics with you all day long, I suppose. But there's one quote which I've set the scene for me, and, and having had this quote, I realised, well, for every other talk, we should put in a quote there of some form. This quote comes from Sue Fitzmaurice. And Sue knows intimately what it is like to have a wound, and particularly a smelly wound. And I want to share her quote with you because it really sums all of this up when we are talking about what a smelly wound is like. So here is Sue's quote. Our wounds can so easily turn us into people we don't want to be. Now, I think that is quite potent. But the more I've read that, the more I've let that soak into my head, I begin to get it from her point of view. Here she is in front of you, in front of me, and her wound has made her into somebody she does not want to be. Smell can do that, pain can do that. It changes who we are and what experience we're getting out of life and how we may interact with our loved ones. Dealing with wounds, managing wounds, healing wounds, containing wounds, helping patients with wounds is a great responsibility that you and I have and we can make a difference working with the patient when we know what goals they need to have realised. So if you remember nothing else, think of what Sue said. Wounds make us into people we don't want to be. For me, that was a little bit of a light bulb moment. Here is a chap who has a squamous cell carcinoma, which is producing a lot of stink. Somebody with a pressure injury who you can smell before you even go into the room. This dear lady, I could smell her at the waiting room and that was a good 50 metres away from where the clinic was. A mixture of coliforms and pseudomonas. It was a bit of a eureka situation for her. Somebody who's got a burn to their right leg. This dear soul has got a massive hematoma that's being evacuated from the back of the thigh. And does have, unfortunately, a, a minor bleeding disorder. But this all happened having been run into by a dear lad on a bike who accidentally ran into her leg. And then this is the hematoma that's happened as a result. And yeah, that had a fair whiff to that one too. And then of course our dear lad's gut wound that we saw before. And one of the first things you knew that had this guy in trouble was as soon as you took the dressing off, you knew you were almost needing a gas mask yourself. So what I'm really wanting to do is now focus mainly on just three slides. What is it that's producing the smell? And then what is it we're going to do about it? Well, we've talked about biofilms a lot today. And it was wonderful to hear the point of view that Malcolm was able to give to us as well. When you've got these bacteria all doing their thing in synergy with each other, they can really produce some nasty stuff. You've got bacteria which are quite happy where there is no oxygen the bacteroides, clostridiums and so forth, they produce organic acids and you can see a number of them written down there at the bottom. Now fatty acids have got a bit of a stink to them. In fact they can be quite potent and they can at least make your eyes water if not stimulate your gag reflex. Then you've got the proteolytic bacteria which are the ones that break down protein and break tissue down but it's actually protein itself that they're starting to destroy. And you can see the bacteria listed, there are more than those, but they're the three common ones. And when they are breaking up protein, they're releasing these amines and sulfurs and so on. And as they further break down, they release these enzyme things, which I have to ask myself, who in their right mind would give a chemical substance 
those names. Mabel, you happen to have a malignant wound which is now fungating. You stink to high heaven. You lucky girl, it must be the cadaverin and the putrescine which is having a hell of a party down there. I mean, when you consider how many people have stinky wounds and they may be in end-of-life scenarios, the last thing you want to hear is, Maybelline, we'll help you with your putrescine and cadaverine. <laughs> but yes, that's what we will be doing. But isn't it just dreadful? Who on earth thought of that? I mean, whether they thought it was funny that particular day or not, I don't know. But I would be quite happy for any of us here to look at renaming those two names. Because I'm sure our patients would like something slightly more genteel. You saw that slide earlier. It's about let's understand what's going on. Let's have a cause. Let's now look at their goals and our goals. Let's see what options are available to us. Let's set management outcomes and let's go about with time frames so that our patients can see we have a plan. I'm not sure, no, we'll go back from that picture. Matt earlier today showed a picture of a lady's breast wound, which was a fungating lesion on her right breast and extending onto her right arm. I know that lady. Her name is not really Edith, but for us, I'll call her Edith. I met her not long after she'd been admitted to hospital. And in fact, I smelled her long before I met her. And the biggest priority that Edith had is that she knew she was dying. She didn't have a lot of time left. But the smell was so off-putting that her grandchildren, who are only youngsters, they couldn't come and see Nanny because it made them feel sick. And the biggest wish that Edith had before she died was to have an opportunity to hold and hug and kiss and for one last time say goodbye. There was a goal right there and then. And one of my greatest successes I've ever had is to give Edith that opportunity before she died, which was precious to her and her family. So although it wasn't a healing outcome, it was an outcome that meant something to her, her family, and to me. And it was all around that issue of malodor, that putrezine and cadaverine and all those organic acids. We need to deal with them. So, two slides to go, and we're nearly there. You do see a wound. These are mixed etiology leg ulcers where pseudomonas is gone rampant. That stinks. But knowing its origins, knowing its, by, knowing its diagnosis, that is something which actually we put in, we can heal this box, and we did. There is our dear friend my wife's looking after. That is not in the we can heal box. It is not in the we can manage this box. This is in the palliative, going to get worse. We'll help you get through this with your symptoms controlled the best that we can box. How long he's got with us, I don't know. But he is facing daunting days. And if we can travel that journey with him and giving every bit of support that we can, then we're doing our jobs. I want to show you this slide and one other because here are some options that we have available when it comes to dealing with smell. Kitty litter in the room. I must admit, I've never done it. I remember growing up as a kid, we had a series of cats. My mum seemed to like cats. Um, and I think it was the smell of cat poo and kitty litter that put me off really wanting to have a cat of my own when I grew up. How on earth kitty litter would go in somebody's room with a fungating wound, I'm kind of a bit doubtful. But I can tell you that when you Google dealing with smell, then as part of social media and some of the responses that are out there, kitty litter is seen as being a fair income suggestion. And in fact, I can tell you that all of those things there 
are available in social media, in things that you may read in Woman's Day, No Idea, and some papers, that these things have all popped up and some people take them quite seriously as being legitimate. Bowls of shaving foam in the wound. <clears throat> I've never done it. I don't know how that would particularly work. There is one foam that I can tell you is very good for malodor, and it's been here today on show. If you see bioassist who are there at the door, Mary Graham invented perifoam. It's based on the use of tea tree. And I can tell you that it is actually a very good malodorizing reduction agent. Uh, and I have used that and I continue to use that and it's amazing the number of patients who within a short few minutes say, gee, that smells better. It's not something which is a long-term acting device, but perifoam is something which will give you a degree of bacterial kill and will make things certainly better in the short term. Essential oils, I think, is replacing a smell with a smell. Same with scented candles. I'm not quite sure how you'd walk around with a lit candle in your shorts to make yourself feel better, but you know, it's maybe there is an idea for some. The idea about putting sugar paste, yogurt and Vegemite on a wound surface. Now, you're probably not going to go home and get out your bit of Yoplait and say, I'm going to bang that straight on the wound. But some people do. And there's a reason why these last three things may have a chance of actually offering some small benefit. A number of those bacteria, particularly the ones which break down protein, well, they're eating protein, which is producing those offshoots, the amines, which allows in the cadaverine and the putrazine to be developed. Well, what if you could give the bacteria an energy source other than protein, and so therefore you were not breaking down the same volume of protein? That's the basis on which the yogurt, the sugar paste, and the Vegemite have been suggested. And look, for some people, there have been some reports that it may have provided some benefit. In my own practice, I've not seen that, I've not done that. I cannot re recommend that, but I can tell you that there are records of those things being done. What I'm going to be fascinated is, is that Malcolm's still in the room at the back, so at some point it's going to be worthwhile seeing is can we put some neutrocaine straight on one of these wounds? And he's just talking about it right now. Look. <laughs> Yes, well, come and grab the microphone and then Malcolm can answer that while I quickly go on to the next bit. <laughs> no yogurt in sight, right? But watch this space. Yeah, and there's no reason why you can't use it. So I actually use it on myself. Whenever I get a cut on it, I just put it. So the next RSL Life Conference you come to, look for the Nutricane stand, and there is a wound dressing for you. You heard it here first. Now, what's important is that's a lovely segue, thank you very much, because that leads on to the next slide, because one of the things in which there is a lot of literature on is the use of medicated honey, and I think you've now heard a reason as to why that might be useful. Honey is great at actually reducing bacterial activity. It is actually also another highly energy-rich sugar rich source, so it means that you can be breaking that down rather than protein. Honey is one of the things I've used most when it comes to reducing malodor in wounds. Whether they be malignant, whether they be leg ulcers, whether they be burns, 
honey, I can personally tell you I've had very good experiences with. When it comes to using topical flagell, uh, Matt this morning said, and it, same as my own experience, it is variable. Sometimes flagell will be very good at reducing a microbial burden, but if there is a lot of slough or a lot of exudate, it may not always work that well. Charcoal dressings are fine until they get wet, and then they're no longer acting as an effective filter for you. Silver dressings. Yeah, I think our battery might have gone. I'll use this one. Ta. When your battery goes, it's time to stop, isn't it? So we're nearly there, nearly there. Silver dressings and iodine dressings are known to reduce bacterial counts and wounds. They can also help reduce smell. But when you've got a lot of exudate, you've got a lot of slough, often you'll find silver dressings and iodine dressings are used up quite quickly and they need to have more regular changes than you might normally be used to. So the hydrofiber dressings and also the brand new polyvinyl alcohol ones like we've seen with exofiber, they do seem to offer some capacity at reducing odor. And there is this thing which we don't have in Australia yet, but they're using it in Europe and the US called cyclodextrin. It's something called an oligosaccharide. It's a big molecule that has a capacity to hold water, but as it holds water, it also has a capacity to entrap and encase other molecules, of which some of those can be the organic fatty acids and so forth. So in time, it won't surprise me that we end up seeing some of our modern wound dressings who might come to you with cyclodextrin in rather than carbon as a way of entrapping the molecules that cause odor. So certainly your current antimicrobials may be useful, but in order to get their best benefit, you need to clean the wounds, debride the wounds as best that you can, minimize the amount of slough. But whereas the wonderful thing about honey and also cadexmiridine is that they will actually start to break down slough for you. They are antibiofilm agents in their own right, and they both do seem to have a capacity at reducing some of the fatty acids and the, the uh, putrazine and cadaverine. Uh, but out of all of those, I would have to say the one that I use most often would be honey dressings. And I saw Wayne here from DeFries Industries, Wayne Titmus. Um, DeFries Industries use a, a lot of Manuka honey. They have a great range of Manuka honey products. And they are invaluable for people who've got the stink in their wounds.